Uh, welcome everyone to the new um, uh, uh, sequel of, of, of talks um, in our lecture series, Speech Acts in Grammar and Discourse. This is a, a enterprise of the ERC uh, project Spagat, Speech Acts in, in Grammar and Discourse. And today I'm very happy uh, to have someone, uh, a speaker that is actually in Berlin. So Emmanuel is a lecturer in the Institute of Philosophy at Humboldt University. And right now he's also teaching at the Freie uh, Universität. He got his PhD in 2015 at the University of Oxford, uh, but he also holds a, a bachelor in philosophy here at, uh, from Humboldt University and in German literature, which is, I think, quite interesting because his talk will touch aspects of that. Uh, he's also been to Zurich and at the CSLI in Stanford. His interests include philosophy of language and of information and communication and more broader the analytic philosophy and theory of science. And he has worked on a number of topics that are of great relevance for our topic, speech acts. Uh, in particular, his recent work uh, on lying, various aspects of lying um, is yeah, very interesting, of course, uh, for us. Um, um, so for example, he investigated um, lying with pictures uh, presuppositions and lying, um, yeah, or, and what is the difference between lying and misleading, a topic that I find very interesting too. Um, and uh, on a more general level also, he uh, investigates in his monograph, Semantic Pluralism, uh, to which extent propositions should be seen as context sensitive. And today his talk will be about fiction, in a particular about the nature of speech acts in fiction. Um, and our commentator then is Regine Eckert. She's professor of German and general linguistics at the University of Constance. She's there since 2015. Before she was professor of English at the University of Göttingen. And before that, she was actually at SAS, at our institute. She was assistant director from 2003 to 2005, before she went to Göttingen. Uh, she got her PhD in Stuttgart, and her habilitation was here at Humboldt University in Berlin. Now, Regine has worked on a wide range of issues in semantics. Many of those are of great importance for the topic of speech acts. In particular, her work on questions, she's worked on different aspects of questions, including recently on self-address, raising the issue questions. Also her work, uh, her work on, on the performative marker hereby is very important. Um, and I think what makes her particularly suitable as a commentator for this talk is her interest in literary texts. Uh, that goes back at least to her time in Göttingen, uh, where there is a close collaboration between linguists and literature scientists. And this also has led to an important monograph uh, on free indirect uh, discourse. So I'm looking forward to your talk, Emmanuel, and I think we can start. Great, thank you for the very nice introduction and thanks for having me and thanks to all of you for coming. I'm really excited uh, to present these ideas to you. I have a handout which I'm going to, to put in the chat. There's going to be a link, but I'm also going to share my screen so you can see what's going on. But if you want to go back or forward, then you can download the handout um, at that link. Um, I hope it'll work. So the topic um, of my talk today is the question which kind of actions we perform when we tell stories which kind of um, speech acts do we put forward when we, when we tell for, uh, stories that is a question that has interested uh, philosophers but also linguists for a while and there are a number of received views um, and my aim today is to give this debate on speech acts in fictional works uh, a twist to argue for a view that is often dismissed, but in my view unfairly. And I want to start 
by looking at a puzzle. You uh, haven't shared but, your... Yeah, I'm going to do that now. Okay. Yes, exactly. Thanks. So hopefully now you can see um, my handout. Yeah. Um, and there's a, the cover of a book by Leo Perutz, which interestingly I got to know during my studies uh, of German literature at the HU um, almost 20 years ago. So you were exactly right, Manfred, that this will, uh, this influenced my talk. So I want to uh, start with this um, puzzle about fictive utterances, the kinds of utterances that makes up, make up works of fiction that um, has been discussed quite a lot. Um, and that's the following one. So we have these questions, what, what kind of, um, this question, what kind of speech acts do authors characteristically perform in writing fiction? For example, which kind of speech act did Tolkien perform in uh, writing sentence one, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit? Um, those kind of utterances look, at, on the face of it, they look very much like um, constative speech acts that maybe looks like an assertion or something of the kind. Um, in particular, one looks very similar to um, an utterance of sentence two. In my garden, there is a rabbit. Um, if I utter in my garden as a rabbit, then I'm asserting something. So maybe Tolkien is asserting something by writing down in a hole in the ground, the lift of Hobbit. However, um, it's often been noted that the story can't be that simple because there's some important differences between um, constative speech acts uh, such as two assertions and fictive utterances, the utterances that make up works of fiction. First difference seems to um, have to do with the informativity of fictive utterances. Look, while an utterance such as two would be informative in an um, important way, would tell us something about the world, um, Tolkien's utterance of one um, doesn't seem to be informative, doesn't really uh, look like a report about what the world is like. So that's the first um, proposed difference or observed difference between one and two or between fictive utterances and everyday constative utterances. Then people have said there's a difference in commitment, um, unlike constatives, fictive utterances don't seem to commit the speaker in various varying degrees to the truth of the expressed proposition. That's something Searle, for example, said in his famous 1975 uh, paper. And um, relatedly, um, we, it seems, don't often find reactions that are typical for committal speech acts with fictive utterances. So if someone if I tell you there's a garden in, in my garden, there's a rabbit, and someone might ask me, are you sure? Or how do you know? And these kind of reactions don't really seem very common in the case of fictive utterances. We're not going to ask Tolkien, are you sure um, there's a hobbit who lived in the ground, hole in the ground? A third difference um, has to do with insincerity. Um, of course, everyday constative utterances can be insincere. I could be lying I, when I'm talking about that rabbit. I could be trying to mislead you. But um, it is often said fictive utterances can't be insincere in this way. They can't be lies and they can't be like typical misleading utterances. Um, several theorists have, have um, claimed that. And indeed, there's this quite um, famous saying or quote from Philip Sidney, who says, now for the poet, he nothing affirmeth and therefore never lies. So the idea is, if, if, if you're telling a story, then the um, accusation of lying is like, doesn't even get off the ground. It's ruled out straight away because fictive utterances can't be insincere in the way everyday constative utterances are. And finally, um, maybe not as often mentioned, but mentioned in some cases, there's this idea that fictive utterances are creative. Somehow in telling um, a story in uttering sentences such as one, authors create stories, plots, or fictional characters. And that's the kind of creativity we don't really find with constative utterances. If I'm telling you about the 
rabbit in the garden, then there's no way in which I'm being creative, in which I'm creating a, a story or anything like that. And so this leads to, at least in my impression, to a consensus, at least in the philosophical debate about speech acts and fiction. It might be a bit different in linguistics, so I would be interested to hear from you, but at least my impression of the philosophical debate is um, fictive utterances just aren't constative speech acts, despite the first impression I mentioned earlier. If we want to put them into our classification of speech acts, we have to fit them in in some other way. And um, that's the consensus I'm going to try to challenge a bit later. Before I move on, I want to clarify exactly which utterances um, are at issue here. And I'm going to go along with uh, Catherine Abel's um, view of fictive utterances, according to which these are those utterances involved in the production of works of fiction whose contents play a role in determining what is fictional in those works. That's a bit complicated. Basically, um, one can say the fictive utterances are those that are involved in telling the story and moving along the plot and so on. But there are also some other utterances that aren't really involved in telling a story, which might, for example, give some background to the story. And I just want to mention two of these kinds of other utterances that won't really be at issue here, at least for now. And those are, on the one hand, um, profound utterances that go beyond the scope of the fiction. So we have this very famous example from Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, all happy families are alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, right at the beginning. And here the idea is, well, that doesn't really seem to contribute to the story, it's something that's a more general statement that's meant to transcend the realm of the story. Um, and a similar non-storytelling or non-fictive utterance in, it can appear in fictive uh, works and works of fiction are these background utterances I um, mentioned briefly beforehand, um, which often are meant to be actually historically accurate and can be informative and so on. For example, here's uh, an example from Heather Morris's The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Jews in small towns were being rounded up and transported to work for the Germans. Jews were no longer allowed to work and their businesses had been confiscated. And people have talked about these kinds of utterances in a different way than they've talked about the utterance one, um, Tolkien's utterance. And um, Walton and Dixon have indeed argued that these should be treated as constative speech acts. And I'm very much in agreement with that. Um, and I'm just mentioning that so we have a focus on utterances such as one which are neither background utterances nor profound utterances, but still feature in fictional works. And I'm going to return to these profound utterances and background utterances briefly at the end of the talk. So we had a puzzle, namely fictive utterances look like constatives, but they seem to differ from constatives. And I want to look at three solutions to that puzzle, which are also the three maybe established, more or less established views on fictive utterances in the debate, at least um, in my impression. The first two of these are probably the most um, popular ones. There's the pretense view and the make-believe view. The pretense view, sort of foreshadowed by Frege, but then probably defended by Searle, Lewis, Everett, and many others. It's the idea that, well, Tolkien Although it looks like he's performing a speech act, he doesn't perform a speech act at all. He merely pretends to assert the continent question. So he pretends to assert that in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. So in Austin's terminology, we might say um, Tolkien performs a locutionary act, but not an illocutionary act. That's the first view. The second view, um, also very popular, is the make-believe view. Um, defended by Curry, Garcia Carpentero, Davis, and many others. And here the idea is um, that Tolkien does perform a speech act, but it's not a constative speech act, it's a directive speech act. So in writing down that sentence, he tells us to do something. And what should we do? We should uh, um, make believe the content in question. So the, the sentence or the utterance is an invitation or prescription or um, he asks us to make believe that in a hole in the ground, 
they live to Hobbit. Those are the two standard views, I would say. And then recently, in recent years, a third view has entered the scene, which is the declaration view, according to which um, Tolkien performs a declarative speech act, such as similar to maybe marrying or christening. Um, and what happens is that in writing one, he declares and thereby makes it the case that the content in question is true in The Hobbit. So he makes it the case that in The Hobbit, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. This view has recently um, been defended by Werner, Abel, and Bergman, and Franzen. So we have these three views, which all seem to um, solve the puzzle, and I'm briefly going to um, say how, um, namely by going through the observed differences. So first we have informativity and commitment. And I think it's fairly easy to see that all three views predict non-informativity and the lack of commitment for fictive utterances. So on Searle's view, on the pretense view, no speech act is performed. It's, we just pretend to perform a speech act. So uh, without a speech act, we're not going to be informative and we're not going to take on any commitment. That, follows quite straightforwardly. And on the other two views, on the make-believe view and the declaration view, there is a speech act, but the speech acts involved are of the wrong kind to be committal or of the wrong kind to be informative. Like the point of a directive speech act is to get someone to do something, not to tell us about the world. The point about the declaration, but the declarative speech act is to make something the case and Austin, for example, is very clear that these declarations are not reports about what the world is like and don't commit the speaker to anything. So informativity and um, lack of commitment is uh, non-informativity and lack of commitment is very straightforwardly explained by all three views. Then we have insincerity. That's a little bit more uh, complex. Well, first, one half of insincerity is straightforward, namely lying. So let's assume, as most people do, that lying requires speakers to assert something they believe to be false. Well, if that's the case, then all three views would rule out that fictive utterances can be lies, because on all three views, no assertion is in place, so no lie can be carried out. Um, insincerity doesn't have to... Um, consistent lying, one could also be misleading. How would that fit in with these views? I think the standard case, at least, of misleading would be ruled out by these views too, because the standard case of misleading, at least discussed in the debate on lying, misleading is one in which I assert one thing to suggest something else. For example, Jack asks Jill whether it was her who finished the raspberry jam. Jill hates raspberries, but likes raspberry jam. And she indeed finished the raspberry jam. Truly, but misleadingly, she asserts, I don't like raspberries. So that would be a typical case of misleading. Um, she asserts something true, that she doesn't like raspberries, to suggest something she believes to be false, namely that she didn't finish the jam. And if we look at these kinds of cases, then again, we're not going to find them in works of fiction or, or among fictive utterances because fictive utterances aren't assertions and we can't get like the starting point of the misleading that starts off with this kind of assertion. Then the final observed difference was a uh, difference in creativity. Uh, and here the views do differently well, I think, at accounting for this difference. On the first, firstly, there's a declaration view, which is specifically designed to account for the creativity of fictive utterances, because in performing declarations, we do actually make it the case that something is true in the story. So that fits very well with creativity. And by contrast, it's not so clear whether the pretense view or the make-believe view, whether these can account for apparent creativity. And there might be moves they could make, adherents of this view, these views could make, but I'm not going to go into those because I will later argue that creativity is actually not um, something that a theory of speech acts in fiction should account for. So I just want to note that um, while all three views are pretty well 
suited to account for these aspects. This one is specifically one that the declaration view um, intends to capture. So one might think then we have these various views of uh, speech acts and fiction. They do, all of them do quite well at solving the puzzle of fictive utterances and then the choice or well, the question is which of the three views um, to choose. This one, that one, or the third one. However, I think that's not actually the, the way the situation should be described. I want to um, give this uh, debate, which is very much between these three views, a, a twist by looking at plot twists in fictional works. So plot twists are extremely common in fictional works, probably even more nowadays in um, films or series and so on but also um, in works of literature and in, in novels. And I'm going to focus on novels for now. Um, and then there are different kinds of plot twists. There could be a plot twist where the novel just proceeds and then something unexpected happens and the course of the story somehow shifts or something like that. That could be a plot twist. That's not the kind of plot twist I'm going to be interested in. I want to talk about plot twists that are somehow revealing in the sense that they reveal that the events or what is the case in the story is different from what was originally suggested, or what we were we as readers were originally told. And I'm going to call these um, revelatory plot twists. And I want to highlight or try to make plausible that revelatory plot twists uncover insincere narration. So when we arrive at a plot twist of this kind, then we find out as readers that we've been tricked or misled or possibly even lied to. And then we have to revise our beliefs about what is the case in the story. And there's not so much um, work on plot twists actually, apparently the same is the case in even in, in um, German literature or in, in literature uh, uh, departments, but there's a nice, recent doctoral thesis by Milan Terlunen, if you're interested in examples of plot twists from the 19th and the centuries, uh, 20th century. And Terlunen nicely does say that plot twists often involve this, he doesn't talk about lies, but this feeling of being tricked. And I want to now talk about two concrete examples of plot twists that make apparent, I think, that you can have both misleading fictive utterances and fictive utterances that are lies. So the first plot twist is found in Agatha Christie's The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. So I'm afraid if you haven't read it, I'm going to spoil it now, but I thought that's okay because it's already very well known. Um, and I'm not going to spoil it, the second one, which isn't so well known. Um, so the novel was published in 1926 and had this novel plot twist that it turned out that the person who had murdered Roger Ackroyd was the narrator. So the novel, she tells the novel through the voice of Dr. James Shepard, who assists um, the detective, the retired detective Hercule Poirot in solving a murder case. And for the most part of the story it suggested, strongly suggested that, that Shepard is writing, writing about these different characters. And one of the people he's writing about is a murderer. So some hints point in that direction, some hints point in another direction, very few hints point to himself. But then um, at some point it turns out it was it was himself. And that's the big plot twist and the case, the, the point where we have to revise what some of our beliefs. Um, and if we look at the story as it leads up to the plot twist, I think that's where we're going to find um, lots of misleading fictive utterances. For example, here in chapter five, we have a scene where Shepard and Ackroyd's butler, Parker, they smash through the door of um, the study to find Ackroyd dead in his chair, um, stabbed from behind. And then Parker leaves the room to telephone the police as Shepard tells him to. And then Christy tells us through the narrator, Shepard, he says, um, I did what little had to be done. I was careful not to disturb the position of the, of the body and not to handle the dagger at all. Ackroyd had clearly been dead some little time. 
So I think this is a very good example of a misleading fictive utterance. So if we read the, the book for the first time, we're being told by Shepard, Ackroyd, for example, had been dead, clearly been dead some little time. That strongly suggests that uh, it wasn't him. I mean, he's known exactly how long he's been dead. And now he, only now he comes and tells us he'd clearly been dead some little time as if he just found out from the position of his body. Or here, I was careful not to disturb the position of the body, not to handle the dagger to it. One might think if it was him, then he wouldn't be careful not to disturb the position of the body and not to handle the dagger to it. However, I mean, all of that is compatible with him being the uh, culprit. And indeed, we have no reason to um, distrust what he's saying here in the sense that he probably is speaking truly. Um, and Agatha Christie is... Uh, putting forward true utterances that are very misleading in the sense um, that it was him after all. And then one can, if that's the case, and one reads the story again, then one can make sense of these other parts of this uh, example. I did what little had to be done. It's very abstract and non-committal and, and no object was to be attained by moving it. Somehow that makes sense given that you had to do something like remove some object, I think, because um, that would have um, been put suspicion on himself. So the idea is these fictive utterances misleadingly suggest Shepard isn't a murderer, um, although he in fact is. And when we come to the plot twist, then we find out the previous misleading utterances were in fact misleading. That's the first thing. So this, this case is in, on, on the face of it quite similar to the case of the Raspberry Jam. Um, strictly speaking true, we're being told something true if Jill tells us or Jack that she doesn't like raspberries, but she does so in order to convey something she believes to be false. So there's this apparent similarity. And I think there could be a similarity in how we feel. Again, the, this aspect of being feeling tricked. And I found this um, uh, contemporary review of the novel where the reviewer seems to uh, confirm exactly this feeling when in the last dozen pages of Miss Christie's detective novel, the answer to the question, who can fairly sold up, so somehow tricked or conned or so. But I think there are also even more striking plot twists, revelatory plot twists don't just uncover misleading fictive utterance, but indeed fictive utterance in Leo Pirotz's um, novel, Zwischen 9 and 9, which we saw at the, at the beginning of the handout. And I don't want to spoil, spoil that novel, but it's enough to tell you that we read the novel, it's like almost 200 pages, and on the very last pages, we find out that almost nothing of what we've been previously told about previously told about actually happened. And I think that's a compelling case for having been lied to. So Pierce lied to us when he was telling the story um, up until the plot twist right at the end. It's not a case of Christie sort of misleadingly suggesting something, but we just have to accept, well, oh, that didn't actually happen. That didn't actually happen. Um, we, we really have to revise our uh, beliefs. And there's also a different feeling, I think. One can feel a bit annoyed at uh, Perot's for um, ending the novel like that. Maybe also surprised, maybe also delighted. Maybe there's it's, it's, it's different feelings involved. But with, with Christie's novel, um, we can also feel annoyed at ourselves because we didn't notice it. We, there were some hints, we didn't get them. We somehow participated in our own deception. But I think with Pierotz's novel, I mean, it wasn't really possible um, to anticipate that, that, that uh, what we were being told didn't actually happen. So I think we have different kinds of uh, plot twists that, different, that um, reveal different kinds of insincerity in novels um, and thus give us a strong reason to accept that fictive utterances can be insincere. And I think 
it should be quite clear that this kind of insincerity doesn't really fit with the established views and the established solutions to the puzzles of fictive utterances. So if um, we accept the pretense view, well, then there can't be any lies because no assertions take place. And the same for the other two views and um, because no assertions are in place. Um, and in a similar way, if we accept any of the three of the views, then Christie's um, misleading fictive utterances are very much different from the case of Jill and the raspberry jam, because there's no assertion of something uh, believed to be true involved there either. So I think that gives us a good reason to give the um, view of fictive utterances as constative um, speech acts another chance. And I want to do that in the next uh, pages and parts of the talk and spell it out a bit and um, try to show that it's maybe not as implausible as it has been assumed. So here's a view, um, fairly straightforward, in writing down a sentence such as one, Tolkien makes an assertion about a story or it could be a different kind of constative utterance, but often it will be an assertion. He asserts about the story that in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. And more generally, characteristic fictive utterances are constative speech acts about stories. I want to uh, note that I don't think that every fictive utterance is going to be a constative speech act. I want to be flexible. I think that's not often um, said in these debates. I mean, um, novels can contain questions to the reader or explicit um, directions. I mean, for example, a novel could contain a sentence such, imagine the following, or something like that, where the, where the fourth wall is broken and the reader is addressed. So I don't want to say every fictive utterance is a, a constative speech act, but I want to say characteristically, fictive utterances are constative speech acts. And then, um, of course, much more has to be said about what kinds and how these uh, speech acts work. And that's what I want to do now. And I first want to say that it's not about semantics. It's not about the content of the sentence. The idea is not that uh, if Tolkien uses one to tell a story, the sentence has a different content, different semantic content than when, if he uses the same sentence in, in a non-storytelling context. I mean, I want to, of course, be open for the fact that there could be semantic differences between fictions and non-fictions, and I think there probably are, partly because of this uh, of phenomena such as um, free indirect discourse, about which Regina Eckert has written this really insightful, nice book. So fictive um, utterances or utterances in fiction often involve um, free indirect discourse. It's quite common in the sense that we can sort of switch perspectives. And here's this nice example from uh, Regina Eckert's book. Jonathan was gone before Stanley had finished, but cursed the fellow, he'd ruined Stanley's bath. What an unpractical idiot the man was. Stanley struck out to sea again and then quick, as quickly swam in again and the way he rushed up the beach. So here we start off with the narrator's uh, perspective. Then we somehow go into the perspective of the character, and then we're back again um, on the narrator's perspective. And that's something that's typical for works of fiction, so there could be, uh, and, and these are particular semantic mechanisms involved here, and they could, of course, distinguish fictive utterances from non-fictive utterances. Um, However, I mean, we can also find, um, as, the, as I think Andreas Stocker rightly highlights, uh, free and direct discourse outside the context of fictional works, for example, in retelling history. And so it's going to be a matter of difference in degree. We're going to find uh, free and direct discourse much more often in fiction than in nonfiction. So there will be some differences, of course, but that's not what the speech act view is about. The view is uh, the speech act view is about what we do in using, in uttering these sentences. Um, and I don't want to posit any difference in, in the semantics, just at the level of pragmatics. So the idea is we have um, a sentence such as one, a Tolkien sentence, 
and it can be used in different ways so as to perform constative speech acts with different targets. If I use that sentence um, to tell you about my childhood and the surroundings of my house, for example, then I would be making an assertion about the world, which is obviously false. Um, if Tolkien uses it to tell a story, then he's using it to make an assertion about the story, and it's probably true. Then, of course, we get in-between phenomena. We can get true stories, uh, tr stories that are presented as true to a certain extent. And then there's going to be some kind of overlap between the world and the story. So when I say it's a true story, then I somehow make clear that there's a considerable um, overlap in the sense that what is true in the story, at least the, the main events, should also be true in the world. In that sense, maybe one can use a fictive utterance to say something about the world, maybe a third, maybe just, maybe it's weaker. But the general idea is that in the first instance, in producing fictive utterances, we are asserting or suggesting um, something about stories. Then the question, of course, is what does it mean for an assertion or a different constative utterance to be about a story? And here, I think there are two ways one could go, or at least two ways. First, uh, there's a content-based approach where one says that the content um, of a fictive assertion of one has built in that it's about the story. So it's part of the content that of one that in a hole in the ground, they lived a hobbit in the story, in the hobbit. So that would be a content-based view. I rather... Um, prefer a target-based view where the content is exactly the same. So this is the content of the assertion, not the semantic content. The content of the assertion is exactly the same uh, in both fictive and non-fictive uses or utterances, but the target is different. Um, the first one has, I mean, a, a non-fictive utterance has a world as its target, and uh, in this case, the fictive utterance has the hobbit as its target. Um, I think it's uh, the, we can uh, go for the or should probably go for the target based approach because it requires very little um, innovation, theoretical innovation uh, in two ways. We can very easily spell out um, truth. We can say a constative speech act with a content P and a target A is true if and only if P is true in A. That's what people have said in uh, somewhat different but related contexts, Kaplan and Predelli. And we can also um, talk about the dynamics of com communication in the very, in the same way we would be talking about those in non-fictive um, utterances. So uh, we can say something like this, in reading fiction, we start off with a fresh common ground as uh, a fictional record, as Andreas Stocker calls it. And then we update this, um, story, uh, this uh, common ground or fictional record as the story moves along, in the same way as the common ground in a conversation is updated as the conversation moves along. And for that, we don't need to have the target as part of the content. We just need to know what we should update. And what we should update is, for example, given on the front of the book, says tells us the name of the story. It also tells us whether it's a true story or not. Maybe it is a novel or something. And then all we need to do is do the same as we would do in um, everyday conversation, just what we're updating is something else. So I think, as far as I can see, at least, the target-based approach wouldn't require major innovation. It's fairly, it should be fairly easy to implement. However, of course, we had these observations that seem to push us away from the view that Fictive utterances are constative speech acts. And so I want to return to those and see whether they can be um, somehow explained away. And I think they can. First, there's informativity. Fictive utterances are non informative. That was the observation. And I want to reply well, that's, that's easy to explain on the view I'm proposing because fictive utterances provide information about stories whereas non-fictive utterances provide information about the world. So that gives us exactly um, this difference in informativity. I can also do it, put it the other way around. Actually, it's not that 
clear that um, fictive utterances are really non-informative. They're just informative about something else. So I think that kind of would also be a good response to the informativity um, observation. Then there was a lack of commitment. Um, fictive utterances do not commit the speaker in varying degrees to the truth of the expressed proposition. And here my response would be, well, yes, actually they do. Um, the apparent observation is mistaken. And the thing is just that what we're committed um, about or committed to is the content of stories and not stuff about the world. And that sort of explains why we react to fictive utterances differently than we do to um, non-fictive utterances. And here are just two interesting, I think, um, aspects that would, could help to explain the difference in how we react to fictive utterances, why we don't challenge them in the way we challenge everyday constatives. Well, firstly, authors in telling stories they come up with, um, they have first person and privileged access to that story. So if when uh, Tolkien um, published The Hobbit for the first time, he came up with that story. He, he was the person who knew about that story. So of course, we're not going to challenge him. Are you sure that's what happens in the story? In the same way, we're not going to challenge someone if they say, um, I, I'm hungry or I had a nightmare, um, everyday assertion, but we wouldn't challenge them because they probably know best whether they're hungry or whether they had a nightmare. Um, and then the other point would be that sometimes we do actually challenge fictive utterances um, for example, um, we can move away from the case where we're reading a book, um, maybe to a story that's being told at a campfire or among friends or something like that. And if there are some kind of inconsistencies in the story that come up, then I think it wouldn't be unnatural to uh, ask the storyteller, are you sure that's what happened? Um, because that doesn't really fit with what you told us earlier and so on. So I think in those cases, we would we might challenge story, storytellers or we might um, challenge uh, storytellers who are retelling a story. So if I read a story uh, to my sons and I change something about the story, but they happen to know what's, what's going on, then they're going to complain that I got it wrong. And so in retelling a story, we might also be challenged. They might say, that's not, that's not what it says there. That's not what happens at all. Then there's um, insincerity, and I've talked about insincerity already. I think, so the idea was fictive utterances can't be insincere. I think plot twists um, suggest quite strongly that they can be insincere. I think there's something right about um, people saying that the poet never or hardly ever uh, firmeth, uh, or no, hardly ever lieth in that sense, because usually, uh, authors are telling us the truth about their stories. So that's not, it's not that I want to say there's insincerity all the time, but it isn't ruled out, that's the point. So, so while most in, uh, fictive utterances are sincere, I want to say some are not, and that's actually brought out nicely by revelatory plot twists. That leaves uh, creativity, the last point, and that will take uh, the most effort to a diffuse. So the idea was fictive utterances are creative, and we saw that the declaration view is real, well suited uh, to account for that. But none of the other utterance uh, views are really suited uh, to account for that. Neither the make believe view nor the uh, pretense view. And I also think the, the constated view isn't really helpful in accounting for the creativity of fictive utterances. However, I think one might really doubt that. Uh, theory of speech acts and fiction should account for the creativity, at least this kind of creativity in telling stories. So whether you think that um, uh, stories, plots, uh, characters are created in telling stories depends, firstly, on your view of fictional entities. So if you're a Platonist about fictional entities, then you might not need them to be created in the first place. And there have been, people have argued that um, these arguments that have been given for fictional creationism. So for the idea that 
entities are created instead heading stories they're actually misguided so that would be a first way to push back first you only have the problem of creation uh, creativity if you think something has to be created in the first place but more importantly i think we can accept that even if that uh, uh, if fictional entities are created in some way by authors even then i think we sh it shouldn't be a theory of speech acts that does that and here's why so here's an example we can imagine a case where an author comes up with a story on one day works it all out in their head and then the next day she writes it down so now we can ask when was the story created and when were the if so if we think they are being created when were the characters and the plots and so on created and to me it seems much more plausible to say yes once what well, if you want to go for a creation then one, it happens once the uh, authors made up her mind and the story is there in her head. Um, whereas some might be strange where the story is there already, now she writes it down. Is that only when, when it's actually created? That doesn't seem to be the right answer. And if we look at these kinds of timing issues about when things are created, if they are created, fictional characters, for example, then I think we're going to see that there's almost always this gap between coming up with a character and writing something down. Like if I'm typing a story, well, the author will likely have some kind of rough outline of the story, and then it, they flesh out individual parts of the story, and then they say they come up with one part of the story, and then they write it down. But then we've got this gap again between coming up with that part of the story and then writing it down. So I think we just shouldn't look to theories of speech acts in fiction um, when the question is how are fictional entities um, created or stories or plots. So I think actually the creativity um, aspect isn't a, a puzzling aspect of uh, fictive utterances. And in that case, I think we've solved all of the apparent observations. Some of them just aren't observations and others can be um, accounted for by the view of fictive utterances, constative speech acts. And that um, brings me to the end, the outlook. Um, and I, where I want to briefly look at some possible implications. So the first one is that on this view, the actions involved in storytelling and in non-storytelling, in fictive utterances and non-fictive utterances, they're not as different as they may seem on other views. So on other views, there's a, a completely different uh, uh, speech act involved in uh, prescription or invitation to make belief rather than a report. Now I want to say, well, no, actually, they're not that different. Um, in both cases, it's something like a report, but it's about different things. And that is interesting, for example, if we look at debates in the philosophy of science about there's a current debate on whether we should do narrative um, science communication, whether we should tell stories to um, get people informed about developments in science. That seems like for that it would, for example, matter whether what we do in just writing a science report is radically different from um, doing narrative science communication. But as if, if what I've said is right, then actually that difference isn't so big. So if one is okay, it's not so clear that the other one would be not okay. Then I think there's um, an interesting outcome. I, there might be at least, I'm not so sure about this. Uh, when we go back to um, these other kinds of work, uh, utterances in works of fiction. So we saw there were these profound utterances, background utterances, in addition to the fictive utterances. And as so several people have noted, then on the views that are already there in the debate on all three views, we get a kind of a patchwork. We have some utterances which are uh, declarations, say, and others background utterances which are assertions, or we have some utterances which are merely pretended and others which are assertions and so on. So then we get difficult questions. Well, when are we going to count something as a work of fiction? How many of these utterances have to be actually fictive utterances uh, of the kinds these other theories say? And I think we can sidestep these kinds of questions by saying, well, 
they're all all of them are con or most of them at least uh constative utterances and maybe it doesn't matter so much constative speech acts that kind of speech act doesn't matter so much what matters is um whether they are speech acts about stories and i think we could say for example the background utterances and the fictive utterances are speech acts about stories not so not so sure about profound utterances um one, but they're not as common, I would say, and not as problematic as these background utterances. And finally, um, I think it's interesting then if we want to um, look at properties of speech acts in general, say we want to find out more about assertion in particular, um, about notions such as um, commitment in assertion, norms of assertion, or more generally responsibility in assertion, then it makes sense not to just consider non-fictive utterances but also assertions as they appear in stories and that's something that i think isn't really done so much yet so and the same might be the case if we find out that among the utterances in stories there are also other kinds of speech acts as i wanted to leave open earlier and that was all thanks very much for your attention Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, we continue as uh, stated at the beginning with Regine Eckert's comment. So <clears throat> thanks for thanks for this talk. And I do hope that you see a huge slide now. Is that correct? So when preparing this, I tried to start and summarize some main observations of, of the talk. The starting point, what is the speech act of telling a fictitious story? What speech acts are in play? And you very plausibly summarized uh, that there seems an element of assertion that has been observed or theorized about in earlier literature. There is an element of make-believe uh, that we act as if and are not really serious. And that has been taken up by earlier theorists. And there is also this element of creativity and the author as the master of the story uh, he creates, he doesn't report or assert. Um, to lead to your conclusions, I would like to pick up on a last observation that appeared several times on your final slides, uh, where you say, and I fully sympathize with that, I will totally agree with everything essentially. <laughs> You say that fictive utterances do look like constitutive speech acts, and we should pursue that road and try to elaborate where that leads us. You also said in passing that maybe yet there are fewer utterances that are fictive utterances in such novels, fewer than we thought. And to the critic, that might leak like, look like a self-fulfilling theory, and you just neglect, negate of all the troublemakers that those were fictive utterances and the rest are they past muster. So I was tempted to take a closer look uh, at your plot twist examples, um, which are summarized again here. So uh, the first one is a well-known one where we have a first person narrator who is deceiving the reader. And that seems to be a clear case. This is the fictitious character and somehow we just have to understand that this, it's a diary of some kind or so. We watch someone reporting. He's not telling us the truth as a serious, sincere narrator ought to be. And that's part of the joy of reading and coming to the end of that novel. I, so I might spoil a bit more about Zwischen Neun and Neun. So maybe you just close your eyes and ears if you plan to read that novel or your short memory. That's more of a challenge, I agree. And thank you for bringing that also to my attention. It was a real, uh, it will be an exciting read in the next time. It's a third person narrative, which sounds much more reliable than these first person guys. And it turns out at the end that the truth about the worlds of fiction as is not the fictitious common ground of me as a reader as I accumulated over the first n minus one pages up to page n, where it collapses and we understand that the content is about an entirely different epistemic domain, doxastic domain than what we thought all along. And that, that is a real challenger. I'm looking forward to understanding what goes on there. But with all these um, challenges, 
I thought it is always interesting in such situation who is telling what and who knows what, right? We have objective narrators, we have objective narrators who give away a bit of their personality by using speaker oriented items. There are first person narrators who say I, but they're outside the story. Erich Kästner for Germans is a well known example. I left out the international ones. There are first person narrators who are part of the story, right? They act and they tell. Robinson Crusoe in the English speaking world, Karl May with his old chatter hand for the Germans are reliable. They are not, I mean, Karl May, he, he didn't seriously do all that things and that was the scandal. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have novels like Huckleberry Finn, which is always quoted as one where you have a first person narrator and we know what his world is looking like, but it's not only because he tell, he's telling us things, we have to interpret what he is telling us because it's a little boy with a limited vocabulary and limited uh, insights and practices. And finally, you pointed out, even if you have these third person narrators, you can be tricked out by free and direct discourse and similar um, practices. We leave aside the recursive part of telling stories inside the stories because as scientists, we know once you understand the basic case, you can define the rec recursive clause. And so let's leave matters simple. My first question to you as the one in charge of all this myth, should an ideal theory of fictive utterances take care of who is speaking in some way as part of the theory? And I think that could be an interesting extension and maybe it's already what you plan on. Uh, my second thoughts were circling around uh, your the story, which is the target of the utterance or what it is about. And I, I'm too much of an engineer, and maybe I didn't, I wasn't able to interpret your theory or your su suggestions to your full depth. But I love to say, okay, give me, give me something logic, and then I try out how far we go, and then we see what the problem could be, and then we have to. Um, take repair measures if necessary. So I think you're, this is a, a clarification comment maybe. I'd take your story as a good old set of worlds, those that are compatible with the fiction that the author has in mind. This is underspecified. The author never knows everything about their world, right? They say so, they have not spooled, and it would be inhumanly impossible, right? We never can describe singleton sets of worlds. Nobody can do that. But then a conceptual paradox arises, particularly when you talk to people from literature science, right? Because there is a strong intuition that it makes sense to refer to the world of the story. It's one, right? It's the world of old Shatterhand or the world of these hobbits, right? Um, so in a recent paper in a very nice um, volume edited by Immer, who is somewhere here, hello, and Andrea Stocke again, uh, I try to, um, marry or, or find out more about how to represent the speaker actually by building on earlier insights from file change semantics and DRT. And I think as a side result, we can also shed more light on this conceptual paradox about the world and the manifold of worlds. Uh, when we use DRT, we use discourse reference as represent, uh, to represent into people, right, reference. But if you look into the logic of the, the mechanism, uh, they stand for sets of people or entities. So in the famous sentence, a man entered into park, that's an existential statement. But technically the discourse reference X for the man is a placeholder for all the freaking men who entered the park in the world we are talking about. And usually there will be more than one. I was taking care of the speaker, but we can leave that aside for now. But if you look at the world in which the utterance takes place, right? If we have a placeholder for that, DRT will tell you it's a placeholder for the whole huge set of worlds that could be the one that the author had in mind when inventing and sorting out their story. And so the last line is a line of hope here. What starts as a set, the fictitious common ground as I compile it while reading, or the story that this author had in mind while writing, is the set of all those worlds that could be a possible world of that discourse referent. And then in terms of discourse representation theory, you would say that is the world of my story, 
the one existential parameter that we are talking about. It completely parallel to the man who entered the park. And maybe that makes the story in terms of a set of world less spooky or a lot more acceptable for more camps of researchers. Finally, the make-believe. Uh, I think the only who really does pretense in fiction is the reader, right? You immerse yourself into an utterance context as soon as you open the book and start reading. I leave Constance in the real world and move to Constance where hobbits lived like centuries ago, somewhere towards the North Pole, or I don't know where they're supposed to reside. And now we deceiver this utterance situation where we come into. Is there a first person who's telling me that or not? What kind of person seems this I to be? Is that a reliable person or is it a deprived person? Is it a non-cooperating person? Is it a child? What kind of guy is that? What attitude does they have? Will he follow Grice's maxims or will they violate by Grice's maxims? Maybe it's not clear in the first sentence, but over the first pages, usually you get feeling for what, what is going on. And so I totally agree, not all utterances in that story are assertions that should go in this fictitious common ground or information space, but we interpret what we get from speakers of different kinds and build up what we understand the world of the story to look like. When we are with a third person uh, perspective, you see it can be neutral, then we're good. But it could also be littered with free indirect discourse, a leap to read, focalizations of all kinds. And that tilts then the perspective and what we understand and parse. And sometimes to a wrong corner, as in your very exciting 9 to 9 story. I'm looking forward to do an analysis sentence by sentence, but I only got the book two days ago. I barely slept at night because I thought I have to cover that so I can understand what, what the fun of that example is. Anyway, this small list already singles out quite a bit of room for error or plot twists or deception, which are not by the author, but it might be by someone who counts as a protagonist or, or a communicating protagonist for that particular novel. Now, I couldn't resist the temptation to end with something I consider a real challenge about um, faithful, sincere authors or malevolent authors. And I think here we are at another corner that I'm very curious about. Wait, I can't really read that because there is too many faces here now. The English translations at the bottom are really determined. As, als ich einmal die Treppe hinaufging, kam mir von oben kommend ein großer, lachender Mann entgegen. Wir waren beide derart überrascht von dieser Begegnung, dass wir keine Zeit hatten, einander zu grüßen. Ich kannte den Mann nicht, hatte aber das Gefühl, dass die Geschichte, die ich begonnen habe, anders hätte ausgehen können als die, die ich hiermit beende. <lacht> ja, you laugh. <lacht> So I'm baffled by this type of story. Uh, the, my, the author, Rohr Wolf, um, he recently died, but he wrote uh, mainly before 2000, but there are several edited volumes, one even translated into English. So who wants to reference, just write me an email. And that's my last series of questions. What, what, would, should, what would should we say about these? We also want to predict that these are constitutive speech acts. And if yes, then about what? Is there a story in that case? Or is that an author who gets paid to pretend he's writing novels, but actually doesn't? So that ends my short commentary and I look forward to the general discussion now. I'll also oh, stop Thank you very much. Thank you, it was, was super interesting and helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you have some time, uh, not too much, please, two, three, four minutes or so, uh, Emmanuel, if you want to react mm -hmm. directly, and then we open the discussion and stop the recording. Yes, uh, so thank you so much. That's yeah, very helpful. I think um, I, I couldn't agree more with the beginning where you said there's an element of assertion, one of make-believe and one of performatives. And I one I thought whether one way one can capture that and also that that would relate to your point on make-believe is that at least on the view I like um, 
there can be some kind of, um, um, there could even be some pretense involved in tell, telling story. Maybe that's what people think happens in uh, free and direct discourse. So somehow that's a way of expressing content. That's why I would say I would locate that at the locutionary level somehow. Then I would say we're being told the story. And on my view, telling the story is just telling us about the story. And that's what happens at the illocutionary level. And then I couldn't agree more that the make-believe is the result of the telling, is the perlocution. And I think maybe that way would be a way to fit in these various aspects. I haven't fit in the performative aspect yet, but um, that would be one way of giving each um, uh, aspect a, a certain role. But then of that, on that view, of course, if we're interested in speech acts, we're interested in the middle one of these in, in, this, in, in the illocutionary act. Yes, I'm Christy on the character narrator difference. So I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about good examples and uh, there's always a problem about who's narrating. And I had some examples in previous versions where it seemed that the author themselves is narrating, for example, at uh, the beginning of the name of the rose, Umberto Eco gives a uh, sort of a preface where he says, I was handed this manuscript and uh, and then I, then he talks about how he was deciding whether to translate it and so on. And it seems to me that he's uh, speaking as himself and that he's probably lying um, and in that way making the uh, story more convincing. So it's a good lie. But then then the questions I got would got would, would, would always be well, but he's is this actually the actual Umberto Eco or fictional one and so on. So I was hoping not had to have to get into that whole uh, mess and just look at what the author is doing. And of course, that's less clear in first person than in third person narration. But still, I think there's a way we can say, well, what's going on here? Christy is telling us a story through the voice of Shepard and so on. But in the end, she's writing these sentences. She's crafting the sentences in a way that makes them misleading, um, but not lies and so on. So that, that would be my my hope that I some, some, can somehow sidestep the whole narrator character uh, difficulties by looking at what the author is actually doing. And of course, that would require a view of assertion that is broader than many views of assertion, because then we can use sort of just a report of what someone said to assert something. That's sort of, the, there's, it's, it's kind of a, a broad view of the assertion. So I, maybe I should have mentioned that, yeah. Um, then I, I like the comments on what makes up a story. Again, my hope would be what we're interested in speech acts. So I can stay non-committal about what stories are. I think minimally stories are maybe somehow uh, states of affairs or a combination of states of affairs and course of, uh, courses of events. And I, again, I think it's completely right that they're often under specified and there are difficult questions about to which extent they're specified and who does the specifying. Um, now my hope, but I may, may be wrong, was that I can just say, well, we sort of know what a story is and we just um, can say, this is what the speech acts are about. And then if we are interested in stories, what they are, that's an interesting metaphysical question, but it's not a, a speech act question. And then maybe one last point on the, so where does the deciphering happen? Um, and I think, again, that's something that fits quite nicely with the view I like, is that you have stories that are that li leave little room for interpretation and stories that leave a lot of room for interpretation. And that's the same with non-fictive utterances. We, I can give you a very exact report of what happened yesterday, for example, and it can be super long and I can tell you everything and then you will have very little to interpret. Or I could just give you a true sentence uh, report that could maybe that suggests something and so on. So I think that that might be kind of a nice parallel again. And the Roar Wolf uh, story is great. I think, yeah, it's constatives until he talks about the story itself and then it's somehow complicated. But until then, it's a very short story, very underspecified. Yeah, thanks, you should say it's about the story and he would be perfect. That's why I thought I want to have an entity right. that is the story and then I can go. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't uh, answer. Yeah, this is fine. Uh, thank you very much. So I stop recording now and open the discussion.